Tonight, today we're going to be speaking about igniting your family for manifested glory. Exodus 1.22 Every now and again, God will have me study a specific person in the Bible. Because what happened before can happen again. And God gives us clues and cues about the success in their lives how they overcome so many areas in their lives. And in Exodus 1.22, it says, Pharaoh gave the order to all people, every boy that is born in Egypt, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. The Israelites were living as slaves for 400 years and Pharaoh, driven by hate and greed and just wickedness, not only did he want to enslave them, but now he wanted to kill off all the boys when they were born. So every woman that is pregnant, in those days they didn't have ultrasound. So she doesn't know if she's able to keep the baby. Because if he's born a boy, Pharaoh, by law, it was a law that was made. And so we have to understand that sometimes we live in a nation where laws come out of an evil heart and an evil government. And people are seriously at risk. And many lose their lives because of dangerous and wicked laws to annihilate people because of their race, kill them off if they're black, kill them off if they're Indians, kill them off if they're Asians. They're not worth to be on planet Earth. That was Hitler's mind, and it was a law. So the soldiers and the police cooperated with him, and many lost their lives. And so now we have the blood of innocent children the cries of wounded parents, what would be a joyous celebration in a hospital room for a child become tears of mourning and tears of pain. The crying and the suffering reach to a tipping point that God decide enough is enough. But every time God is going to do something on earth, it seems like he chooses a person to cooperate. Today, if you need a change in your life, God is going to show us how we can trigger glory. How we can trigger manifested glory. It's one thing to read about it, but it's one thing to reproduce it in our lives. So how can we come to the place where we not only read about it, but we are experiencing it? When it comes to the family, it, it is challenging. Because in a family, when one is hurt, everybody's hurt. When one person fails, it affects a whole group of people. If poverty strike everybody, it affects everybody. So it, it is very complex that the enemy know if he can hurt one person in a family, he has access to all. Parents begin to worry. People can get shame, come upon them. Different things that happened. And sometimes parents don't know why or how or who or what is this. Shocked, shocked. That couldn't be my daughter couldn't be my daughter. They're lying. They're lying. It couldn't be my son. They're lying. They're lying. But it is. And so in Acts 16, 31, God has given us a promise. When you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, Acts 16, 31, when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, God says this, you will be saved, and your household will be saved. Let's lift up our hands and say, God, I believe. I believe you. In spite of what I see, I believe you. 
My daughter will not go to hell. I believe you. My son will not go to hell. I believe you. My sister, my brother, my cousins, right to the third and fourth generation. God Almighty cut off hell as the destiny today. Because once he saved you, it becomes a generational salvation. And what is great this morning for us to be encouraged, it only takes one person to save a whole family. God is so great that he's just looking for one, and you might be the one. It says that Abraham was a man of faith. He was ignited in this powerful, great glory that Jesus described because it's the same God of Abraham that came in the flesh and became Jesus. He died on the cross. He calls it powerful, great glory. And that, one of the Hebrew words for that is kahil. And Abraham believed, and because of that, his wife was healed of barrenness. His son Isaac became the child of promise to birth nations. It only takes one to save a family. David was 17 years old when he was ignited with glory to save his family. He destroyed Goliath. Not only saved his family, but he saved a nation. It only takes one. A grandmother called Lois and a mother, Eunice, who had a son, called Timothy, saved Timothy. Grandparents, you are needed. You are in service. You are called. You know, some people say, oh, I can't wait for my children to get out of the house. They'll get out of the house so you can clean it and keep it clean. But they'll never get out of your heart. And you think, oh, the grandchildren, the grandchildren, the same thing. But Grandmother Lois and Mother Eunice, their lives and their tactical strategy for raising children made Timothy became one of the authors of the Bible. Let's clap unto grandmothers who are grandmothers. <coughs> you can't recognize them now because every hair is dyed and, <laughs> and the girdle is working. <laughs> For men, men and women girdle. You do know that they have men and women girdle, eh? Okay, now. So, it is, the only thing that might give us a little notice of it is when the skulls start to shine. <laughs> and we have an idea, oh, okay, all right then. He's not 17 anymore. <laughs> wow. Miriam was 12 years old. And she was ignited with glory. She saved her mother. She saved her brother. She saved her family. Miriam, at 12 years old, please don't postpone the glory in your children. Don't limit them. You need to see the glory and encourage them to become the best you. Rahab, a former prostitute, ignited with glory. She saved her mother, brother, cousins, everyone. She negotiated and God says, Rahab, if you believe I can save all of your families who are Canaanites, so be it. It only takes one to save your family. Gideon was a man ignited with glory to save his family. And also Israel. I wondered why God chose Gideon. Because he wasn't in a state to be chosen. He felt abandoned. He was negative. Even when God came to him, he was saying, where are you? And who are you? And why are you coming now? You have abandoned us, etc., etc., etc. But God deflected it because there's a reason, a legal reason why Gideon was chosen. God neglected every negativity that Gideon threw at him. You are a mighty warrior. Kail, Kail. I am transforming you for my purpose and for yours. And when Gideon complained, God says, ignore. 
Go in the strength you have. Go in the Kyle grace, the Kyle glory that you have. Why Gideon? Why would he choose someone that has, that has no faith in God anymore? Leave me alone, don't even try, etc., etc. Why? Legally, it was Gideon's father that built the altars and encouraged Israel into idolatry. Sometimes when God does things and choose a person, we don't understand the why, but sometimes God satisfies in the natural something in the, in the spiritual. There was a reason why God went to Abram and said, offer your son as a sacrifice. To prove that there was a man on earth full of faith that will obey me even with pain. It was to prove that there's a man that loved me enough, not just me loving people. And when he was, Abram was about to obey God and sacrifice his one and only son, the angel came and held his hand and said, no, it was a test. It wasn't only a test, it was to satisfy a legal law before the kingdoms of darkness and the kingdoms of this earth. Because one day, God will love us so much that he will sacrifice his son. A lot of time God works in parallel and it has reasons. And if you don't understand kingdom law, we don't get it, we don't understand it, and we don't know how to work it. And that's why we're studying people. And the people we study were imperfect, so we qualify. So, so Satan can't come in and tell you, you don't qualify for this and you don't qualify for this. and you go. No, if God chooses you, you are qualified. Because what you don't have, he will make you. He said to Abram, I will make you great. He, he, you know, he, he said to Gideon, you are a mighty warrior now. I know you're hiding in the wine press, but I make you a mighty warrior. And Gideon became leader and judge of Israel. I mean, God will make you into what all he needs is your yes. Moses, I will make you like God before Pharaoh. Well, he's going to kill me. No, Moses, all I need you is to go say what I tell you to tell him, and then I will do the miraculous to use you that you can even step into water and it divide. Do you believe that, Moses? Thank God, God didn't tell Moses that. Because God, Moses would say, yeah, right, you know, and talk the, the lack of faith that he had. And so we see how God is so great. And this is why Jesus called his glory powerful, great, glory. You will see me come down. Why? Because it's a powerful, great glory that God will bestow upon chosen servants. If you're not serving God, you don't need the glory. If you're not going to give him glory, he won't give you glory. But when you are a servant and focused and that he can trust you, he bestow it upon you to work with you, in you, and through you to accomplish his purpose on earth. And so let's look at the Kyle brand again, the, the PowerPoint, because it's good to know what God brand you. Because if God brand Gideon as a mighty warrior and Gideon is hiding in the press, then it, it's ridiculous. Either, like, who, who is that? I mean, I know who I am. So how are you calling me mighty warrior? And how are you telling me to go in the strength you have? It means he's going to transform you. That's why God brand you as a Christian. You have to understand when you say, I am a Christian, that is a great thing you're saying. It means Christ has literally put his spiritual DNA in you. And so you can now, like Jesus said, be my witness on earth. I'm calling you Christians. Every time you stand up and say, I'm a Christian, you are activating potential glory. And that glory is for his purpose. So the word kail, 
When God says power and great glory, it means reverence for God. It means a worshiper like David. It means moral, which means you're serious about your Christianity and about you. You're not one person in church and one person outside. Uh, excellent, efficient, wise, strong, host, which means God has an army to fight with you and for you. Valiant, viral, trained, noble, virtuous, worthy, mighty warrior, army, goods, riches, etc., etc., etc. God is so glorious that there's no one word that can describe him. You'd have to write a whole Bible with nothing but God's glory is, and that's it. A hundred pages later, God's glory, and that glory is in you. That glory is in you. And that's why he needs us so much that he patiently is trying to teach us and to train us. And I mean, the, 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 the definition of Kail ended with powerful and great. Those are the two words that Jesus used. I'm not just coming down with glory. I'm coming with powerful and great glory. And I am in you. And that's why Paul says, if, if, look, if only we could understand the riches of God's glory in us. Because you see, there are things that need to happen in the last of the last days. And he needs his church to cooperate with him. He needs his church to be like Jesus in this world. It is easier for you to say to be like Jesus because you don't want to say to be like God. But God said to Moses, you will be like God. We know Jesus is God. But let's say like Jesus if it's easier for you. Because he says you will be his witness. Meaning what? When Pharaoh see you, they see God. They see Jesus who is the son of God. That's how it works. And so if you're ready to trigger yourself, and a 12-year-old was triggered, Miriam, and you're going to see that, and a 17-year-old boy became like Jesus, and these people were able to do exceedingly and abundantly what they could even imagine because it's God working in them and through them for his purpose. So that, will, that, that wicked law was passed, and here was a woman, a mother, called Jochebed. So in Exodus chapter 2, a man in the house of Levi, Jochebed's husband, his name was Amram. And they were of the Levi tribe, which means they are the priestly tribe. He married a Levite woman, Jochebed, and she became pregnant, gave birth to a son, but when this woman saw the baby, she says, no way in this heaven or earth is that my child is going to be killed by that vicious law. And we're going to talk about how we can trigger this kind of glory because I really believe God wants it now. There's a fierce urgency of now. People of God, we just heard a, t a, a, a sharing about the trafficking, the slave trafficking, the wickedness that is happening in our world, the news, you listen to the news and all of that. There's a fierce urgency of now even how to pray for your children. Children are at risk. She says he's not going to kill my son. And so it takes, but it takes one person in a family to trigger manifested glory in the entire family. Oh, people of God, let's clap on that. Lift up your hands and say, God, tell me how, show me how I'm ready to work this thing. I'm ready. This mother was sensitive to the Holy Spirit about the potential for her boy. He's a fine son. She obviously understood her identity. They were Levites, so they were a praying family. They were a priestly family. And she knew that her identity is from sons and daughters of Abraham. She knew that Abraham was a covenant man. 
She knew that God blessed Abraham and his seed for generations. She knew that anyone that cursed them, God will curse. Anyone who blessed them, God will bless. She knew the covenant blessings of Abraham. And she woke up one day and said, what is this? We're just accepting this. You know, just like how sometimes as Christians, we call ourselves Christians. But we're just accepting this nonsense. We're accepting this pain. We're dumbed down. We're muted. We're not even feeling anymore. What is wrong with us? And she woke up and said, you will not kill my son. And she called on Jehovah. Come on, say the name. Say, say Jehovah. Say Jehovah the Most High. Because if you have think this morning, the same God is here in this place. Clap unto Jehovah. She got ready. She says, I will save my son. Do you know how? I don't know how. Do you have any resources? I don't have resources, but I am telling you. Which means I am going to activate the supernatural as I listen for the practical. Are you understand me? Okay, lift up your hands. It means if you're ready for change... You have to be ready to do the natural so that God can do the supernatural. She was ready. She was like Hannah. God, I am barren. I'm tired of the pain. But if you give me a son, I will give him back to you. A covenant prayer means you're ready to do whatever it takes to break something in your life. That's what that kind of prayer is. And so Hannah was ready. Jochebed was ready. The family was ready for this. And God Almighty was also ready. You see, once you get ready, God get ready. You understand what I'm saying? Because if you're not ready, you like to live in your pain. If you're not ready to get over the situation. If you're not ready because you want to nurse your hurt. If you're not ready because you're looking for pity. God is not going to give you pity. He has to wake and wait until you wake up. Hello, who are you? If I ask you, who are you? You should say, I'm a Christian. Say they, who are you? Who are you? Who are you? When you are ready and you believe in God, then he gets ready. He, God was ready. Because the Bible says in Exodus 3 that he heard the cries, he saw the misery, he says, enough, I have come down, Moses, in a burning bush. That should be a clue to Moses. <laughs> if God is fire in a burning bush and the bush is not burning up, and then a voice came out of the bush and began to speak to you and call you by your name. Now, that should be a clue <laughs> to Moses. That you're now in a realm where all things are possible. My God. Clap unto the Lord, people. Because if you tell somebody that, they will say, it's impossible. What do you mean by the bush is burning and nobody sees it? It can't be. It's impossible. Not on this earth. When anybody say that to you, you are ready with glory because you're not going to stay in the gutter with them. You're going to fly in the wings of glory. Now the chicken is talking to you. The chicken is talking to you. You can't fly. You can't fly. You can't fly. And the eagle says, I'm not a chicken. I'm an eagle. Let me show you what God can do. Come on, somebody say hallelujah. Because if your friends are only chickens, quack, 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 quack. No, it's the duck that quack. What is the noise of the chicken again? Oh, oh wow. Gary, you really know that that well? Oh, it's Richard. No, that's, that sounds more like normal. Wow. People of God. Don't let the enemy stop you from saving your son. Don't let the enemy stop you from saving your daughter. Don't let the enemy get you out of poverty. Don't let the enemy 
the, the doctor has a say, but God has a final say. Don't let any man or any woman stop you from what God can do. And so God was ready. God was ready to prove his almighty power on earth. He was ready to challenge the forces of darkness. He was ready to partner with his human sons and daughters for a move of God on earth. It was a set time. Enough is enough. Luke 21, 27. Jesus talk about the set time. At that time, they will see the son of man come in in cloud with Kyle glory, powerful, great glory at the set time. Is this the set time in your house? Are you ready now for your miracle? Are you saying, God, enough is enough? Set time. Time for freedom. Time to break strongholds. Time to ignite hope and birth faith. So the eyes of the Lord will look in the earth and see your heart of faith and your readiness to work. To ignite it. David in Psalm 57 verse 8 says, Awake my glory. Awake lute and harp. Let me get my, my musical instrument. I will awake the dawn. What is the dawn? I will awake my new beginning. I will awake a future of brilliance, a future of power, a future with resources. I am tired and sick and tired of being sick and tired. You understand what I'm saying? I am a, I'm tired of the negatives. Enough is enough. And I'm not going to just complain. I'm going to pray and I'm going to activate glory because in the natural, it cannot work. Hey, but that's not where I stop. I also live in the supernatural. I have access to God. Come on, Jehovah. Come on, say the name Jehovah. Say the name Yahweh. Say the name Jesus. My God. She was ready and God found her. Second Chronicles 16.9 says the eyes of the Lord. In the New Living Translation it says it this way. The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose heart. The heart is fully committed to him. He's looking for you. If you are ready. And if you have the faith. And if you believe that with God, all things are possible. Anybody here truly believe? No, seriously. Do you really believe that all things are possible in your life? No, seriously. Lift up your hands so that he can say it. Say, God, I believe. I believe. And I will receive. So there are five things to consider when you want to save your family. Because I tell you people, it is promised. It is promised. Because we see, once you make up your mind and God know that you're not going to live in this life anymore. You're tired of it. Because you were so subdued that you say this is it. And you're going to stay like this forever. Because it can't change. Once you decide that God can do it, then God will now act glory in you and number one you will receive power for change Jesus said it Jehovah came in the flesh and said it to his disciples in Exodus 2 verse 3 when when the mother could not hide the son any longer longer she now had to be creative you notice the word Kail creative power ability solutionist you cannot just talk. The kingdom is not only talk, but in power. God has given us the power, even through our community service, to help people in such a mi miraculous way. It's power. It's not just talk, talk, talk. It's power. What can you do to change the situation? Are you ready to change the situation? Or are you subdued and lack faith? That your son will be healed. Your daughter will be healed. Your financial will be healed. A relationship will be... Uh, have you given up and said, this is it. Just going to live with this. If you haven't given up, there's an angel over you. Lift your hands. If you haven't given up, 
there's an angel over you that is ready to work at your address. Oh, just open your mouth and praise Jesus right now. Just begin to thank Jesus. Be ready. Let's get ready for a new thing. Let's get ready for a new thing. Hallelujah. Let's get ready for the new thing. Because God will give you imagination, creativity, and ability, and innovation. My God. This woman, a slave, created a solution for her boy. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket and, you know, she coated it with tar and pitch. What is that? Ability, creativity, innovation. And then she placed the child in secured blankets and put it in the reed along the bank of the Nile. In other words, God gave her supernatural wisdom. Seriously. For this woman to turn a basket into a boat. I don't know too many a scientist that can do that but I tell you something when you're ready you will be able to do the incredible come on lift up your hands and say I'm God I am ready I am ready you know I was speaking to someone and she was struggling at work you know I can't do it I'm too it's too stressful it can't happen it, it's just too much too much and God delivered her, and I asked her last week, how is it going at work? Oh, great. As a matter of fact, I'm praying for the, the team, and I, the, the boss has asked me to lead in, in, in Bible and to pray for them every, every week. God turned it around for the glory of God. Oh, lift up a clap unto the Lord again, because if God can do it for this one, God will do it for you. God will do it for you. So God will give you the strength once you make your decision. I am not running. I'm going to stay here. And once you make that decision, God now will begin to change your perspective. And he will give you strength and creativity and ability to move to the next land. Number two. So number one, God will give you power for change. Number two, God will give you strength. God said to Gideon, go in the strength you have. God will give you strength to have guts. Now, is guts a global language? God will give you strength. What, what is a word for guts so that everybody can understand? Courage. Courage. God will give you courage to do the impossible. Because there's some things that you need supernatural help to make it happen. And this woman got the courage to stand up and said, not my son. And God began to give courage and brilliance and everything. Number three, God will give you strategy. Because you need the strategy to complete what you ask. So he gave her the strategy, get the boat, get the tar, cover the tar, put the baby in the reeds, don't put it in the, fr in the, in the middle of the river oh, so that it will drown. Alligators getters will get it there. And God tell her everything, strategy. Say strategy. You can have power, you can have strength, but you need a strategy. So number three, even to the fact that in verse four of Exodus two, little Miriam, the 12 year old, was the bodyguard for Moses, 12 year olds. Don't doubt the 12 year olds, please. Don't hold them back, please. They can read, they can write, they can do maths. Don't inhibit their glory. Pray. And give them all the things that we're talking about. Free homo classes. Free all of this. Is to strengthen them. Because your son is a Moses. Your son is a Mary. Your son is an Esther. So you don't know. So you, you have to have the, the kind of tactical strength. To train them and don't resist them. And, and don't hinder them. And so you will God get power for change. You will have courage to do what you need to do. And then God will give you the strategy, what you need to do. And then God will give you a powerful force called favor. If the 
they told you 60 times you're not getting the job and you're here today, go out tomorrow and you will get favor. They will change their mind. Your enemies will serve you. When Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, her attendants were walking along the bank. You see, when God is working with you now, he's in the details. Okay, go down there at 7 a.m. Details. Because the basket had to come there at the right time. The princess had to be, be there the right time. You do the natural, God will take care of the details. If he wants you to meet somebody and they were going out, they're flying out, something will happen and the plane is delayed. And he give you the interview right there. In the, That's okay, I'll come to the airport and see you and you can give me my interview there. Once you say to God, I am ready and I have courage and I'm ready to obey. I mean, he will turn things around that everything, whether princess or not, will be at the right place at the right time. The, with the, we're looking in the logistics of the wind factor and all of that, that the, the basket is going to reach because of the wind and everything at a certain time. God fixed it. It's a fixed fight. You understand what I'm saying? The outcome is out there already. You just go and just smile. Practice your smile. Wow, I heard crick, 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 crick. <laughs> Some people have to smile for a while, and I really heard the quick, crick, crick, crick happening. Wow. I mean, can you imagine? So this is what this woman now, the princess is on the Nile to bathe and her attendant walking on the river bank. And then the attendant saw the basket among the reeds and sent, and the princess then sent the slave girl to get it. You sent the slave girl to get it. The slave girl that your father is abusing. You send the slave girl to get it. But Jehovah sent your slave girl to save and serve the slave son. You understand what I'm saying? Because God is in the job. It's a job. You give God. I mean, this is a big plan for God. <laughs> I, mean, he, I tell you, God is, I shouldn't even have to say it, but in case you don't know it, God is smarter than the enemy. Shouldn't have to say that. I mean, it's almost sacrilegious to say something like that. Because remember, God crushed Satan's head. So he's half, you know. God said to the devil, Genesis 3, I will crush your head. So his head is now crushed. So that's why the insanity and all of that is getting on because he's crazy. And he always set up himself to set up himself because he's not thinking too powerful, but a dangerous. You know, we have people that are presidents, powerful, but dangerous to themselves as well because they, they set up them, their selves to fail eventually. And the enemies will eventually destroy them as well. But God... She just blessed this baby boy. And then she opened the basket and she saw the baby crying. God even pinched the baby so he could cry at the right time. <laughs> Can you imagine? I mean, no God like Jehovah. Come on, somebody say it with me. No God like Jehovah. No God like Jehovah. So she felt sorry for him. Yes, sweetheart. Feel sorry for the enemy. This is one of the Hebrew babies. Oh, so you know that he was destined to die by your father. You know it's a Hebrew baby. So what is God going to make you do? Favor like a force came upon her and she desired the baby. She wanted the baby. I am sorry for this baby. Yes, your father is doing it, but we'll talk later. I'm sorry for the baby. I'm sorry. God will even trigger emotions around you 
so that people will serve you and you will become blessed that no one can curse. Come on, people. That's where you're going. That's where you're going. Kyle glory is a force. It's a powerful force of favor. Jesus grew in favor with God and in favor with man. And so God blessed her with favor. And number five, God will give you provision to save your family. He will give the provision you need in your life. So in Exodus 2, verse 7 to 10, the sister, little Miss 12-year-old Miriam, saw what was happening, saw the, the favor, saw the princess loving Moses and not killing it because they're supposed to throw him in the Nile River to kill it. Sister 12, smarter than anything, said, Ma'am, ma'am, Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Now, can you imagine the 12-year-old girl knew that if you didn't get pregnant and have a baby, you wouldn't have milk in your breast. Can you imagine? She figured that out. So she is something else. And so she said, which means, you know, as a 12-year-old smart, um, she's going to need a Hebrew boy to feed the baby because they didn't have the, the, the milk that you go buy at the... At the, at the corner stone, store in a store, and all of that. They didn't have all of these things that you make up and the baby food and all of this. No, they didn't have that. It's old-fashioned breast milk. That's how it works. And so if you don't even have the milk, you can hire a pregnant, a former pregnant woman to feed your baby on her milk. Did you know that? Because some mothers have excess milk. And so they can feed another baby. And so, fair, I, but Miriam, who trained you, girl? What is it with this girl? I mean, and so the girl said, can I get a Hebrew nurse? Why she used the word Hebrew? Well, the Pharaoh daughter, Princess Newt, was Hebrew anyway. And so Miriam now has to get, because these Hebrew women, they look, the, the, the father look at them and they get pregnant, you know. They were just getting pregnant, 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 pregnant. <laughs> and, and so Pharaoh said, what is happening with these Hebrews? They're too pregnant, pregnantized. And he says, I have, to, I have to do something here with these people, man. I have to kill off their sons because they're going to outnumber us. It's called eugenesis where you intentionally kill off a certain race because you don't want them on planet Earth. That's what it's called now in our city, but it's happening right now. I'm going to kill off certain race. I'm going to do all the experiments on certain people, and I'll make sure there are certain people, and they, they decide who should be alive on planet Earth because it's overpopulated. And so the, the fair, Pharaoh's daughter princess says, okay, um, you go, uh, she answered, and Miriam ran to her mother to get her mother. Can you imagine? Mama, mama, mama. I negotiated that you, you, you can come and nurse Moses. The baby, of course, he wasn't called Moses then. He probably had a Hebrew name. But Miriam was so proud of herself because she's wise. And so Pharaoh's daughter, when the mother came, she went, she brought Jochebed in the palace. You understand? Jochebed found herself in the palace talking to the princess. All things are possible. Lift up your hands, people of God. All things are possible possible. Say to yourself, I will never negate God. I will never limit God. I will never don't believe in God. Yochebed the slave. You can't imagine to go back to our friends. Where were you? Oh, I was with the princess in the palace. Yeah, right. Right. There's some things they're going to share and they won't believe you. It's too good to be true. Somebody say, if it's too good to be true, it's because it's not true. Not in the realm of glory. You understand what I'm saying? If it's too good to be true, you can call it glory. 
And so in verse 9, Princess Pharaoh's daughter said to Jochebed, take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. That's interesting. Jochebed had to keep a, a <laughs> you'd have to practice your straight face when you need it because you can't smile and you can't get excited, you know. Because, no, she's giving me back my baby. You know, this, is, this is far more than I could ever ask or think. So keep your face. You know, don't go, ah! No, don't save the excitement for when you get the first paycheck. Oh, people of God, let's clap unto the Lord. And so Jochebed took home Moses and nursed him five years. This is the first time that a family of slaves was hired to work from home. <laughs> do you want to work in the palace or do you want to work at home? I prefer to work at from home. And got a five-year contract. My God, five year contract, people. It, it, is there anything too hard for God? No. Whose report will you believe? No. My God. And she nursed him. This is a priestly home. She nursed him and she spoke into him. She nursed him and they prayed over him. She nursed him and they are anointed. They anointed him so that nothing that they saw in that boy up to five year old, it is already sown. When you sow Jesus into your children's life, they can never stop it. It can get dormant, but at some time, God is going to stir up the water again. <laughs> Woo! Your family will be saved. I said your family will be saved. Jacobed got a five-year contract with the king, Pharaoh's daughter. You know, every, every, every week money come. Every week money come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lord of mercy. <laughs> it, it, that woman's and this family, their daughter Miriam became a prophet. Their son Aaron was a prophet and priest. He established a priesthood under Moses' leaning. And the family were saved to save a nation. She saved her son Moses. And Moses saved a nation because of one woman. Let's stand to our feet. <laughs>